Okay, hello, Philip. <laughs> Good to see you. Yes, we're live. Um, so my name is Dave Gray, Good and I'm here you. with Philip uh, McKenzie. Philip is uh, the founder and global curator of Influencer Conference, um, and I'll let uh, Philip describe what that is. But my understanding is it's a values-based organization. So it's uh, instead of connecting people along roles and uh, titles and so forth, it's really about connecting people who are interested in making change happen in the world, uh, but based on the their intentions and their values. Is that right? That is a perfect oh, I summation. I could I could have said it. I couldn't said it better myself. So this book that I'm working on uh, is about agility, and um, by agility I just mean the, the ability to maintain some kind of sustained and purposeful action in the world, making your intentions real when you can't control the situation, when the world is throwing complex and difficult things at you. And I know you've worked in uh, you've worked in finance, you've you've worked in uh, organizations, you've worked in media. Um, you have a fascinating background, and, and I'm just you know. So when I say this this idea of uh, being able to handle complexity and uncertainty, do you have any particular uh, stories or lessons that have come to mind for that come to mind for you when I say that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, initially. When I hear those words, I'm, I'm reminded most of, of being on a trading desk. Because mm. um, when you're when you're sitting, literally surrounded by by monitors and a lot of flashing screens and yelling people, that's that's literally what you have to do is process. You, you know, you're processing incredible amounts of information at a, in a short amount of time, and and the the primary job of a of a trader is to know how to manage risk of a particular profile mm -hmm. while having imperfect information. So I think when people think of our financial system, they, they think of it as, and it is very information based, but it's often making the best decision that you can to control risk while not having while having imperfect information. So, you know, I spent six years doing that on a, on a trading desk in an environment that can only be kindly thought of as chaotic. Um, <laughs> but I think I think the those sorts of lessons are are valuable in, in what I do now, yeah. having started Influencer Conference in 2010. I did have yeah. ambitions and visions of growing the conference beyond New York City. And at first, when you do that, you know you're you're kind of going forward with again that sort of idea of imperfect information. You know, you think in your mind that yes, there's going to be an audience and there's going to be people out there, just like you, that that aspire to kind of have these types of conversations. But until you take that leap of faith and actually go out there and and start start doing it, you really don't know. You know, is this really relevant to people outside of your particular bubble? So from so from that perspective, that's one of those parallels between, you know, trading and and kind of working on the conference and, and I guess what I would call more of an innovation field than a strict financial financial modeling field. So uh, if I'm if I'm understanding you right, part of that is you've got to start doing things before you've got to make decisions and do things before you actually know uh, a lot about what you're what you're doing. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, and it, and, it's, and it changes all the time. I mean, when, when I started the conference, it was, you know, right after I left Goldman, I did a couple of other things. I, I worked with a nonprofit organization called Parks Hall, and we, as part of one of our missions there, we were um, printing a magazine. So this is mid-2000s, so it was a, a small publication, literally a small publication. It came with a free CD. You know, CDs being these silver discs that used to play music. Um, you know, because no one knows what they are anymore. Um, and and we just put this magazine out there that kind of got us into this space of understanding culture and tastemakers and and what what was really hot in a variety of different areas. And and so brands started to come to us to activate different strategies in that particular group tastemakers and, and influencers and 
after doing that kind of work for a long time and the frustration that came with that is when I decided I realized that you know brands don't really understand this market they they feel like there's an interest in um, understanding tastemakers and influencers but they're either unwilling or unable to do what it takes to really like galvanize their efforts and so the conference was was born out of that very simple idea that you know I know there's this community out there and this other group of people i.e. marketing folks and ad agency folks want to meet them but don't know how um, so it was very very simple at first but then you know it grew into now taking on a, a slightly different life where we're more about like I said the values based construct so that's that's an idea that wasn't even in my like I didn't even know what that meant in terms of putting it in a concrete way but after having done the, the conference for a couple of years and, and it's growing and you start to see that the conversations are galvanizing around these core groups of ideas. People are looking to connect with one another in an, in an authentic way. They're looking to find ways to collaborate. They're looking to find ways to share and be open with their their work and with their their play. You know, work and play is actually becoming more blurred. You know, um, and all of those are ideas and concepts that when I first started, I might have been living them without even realizing that I was living them. So it was sort of a two-step process of kind of evolving your thought process, evolving to kind of take on these bigger ideas, um, coupled with going out there and, and kind of stumbling through the, the process of building something that will attract these people at the same time. Yeah, that's interesting because you you basically these ideas would not have evolved if you hadn't put them out into the world. Sounds like I mean you, you know it's only in this in it, it, it's only from the process of putting things out there and stumbling through that you created the opportunities and the possibilities for these other things to happen. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. We did a one of our first the first conference we did we had a talk called um, "Curing the Crisis of Fear," and what we what we meant by that is that you know fear is a is a culture based thing. I think it's and again it kind of comes from that marketing world where we would sit down with brand managers and pitch them ideas and talk to them about stuff and there was such fear to do anything. And I saw you know different companies would they were fighting not to lose, hmm. rather than fighting to win, because they were they were so afraid. You would have a brand manager sitting there, and every project they evaluated was based on, okay, how is this going to make me look? So at the end of the year, I'm not going to get fired if this goes wrong, <laughs> you know. And you know that that sort of preser that sort of self preservation hmm. doesn't bode well for taking risk you know so when they're when they're sitting at their at that meeting at the end of the year with their boss or bosses they want to be able to say well you know I advertised in these magazines and I was part of these shows and I worked with these people who are really famous and popular so it's not really I don't know why it didn't work you know <laughs> like as, as long as you can kind of check off those boxes then everyone sort of protects themselves and it was this this idea that if we can cure this this crisis of this culture of fear, then we can we can free ourselves to start to do bigger and better things because there's no penalty involved. And we had a, a bunch of different entrepreneurs on that on that panel, and what really struck me was how open everybody was. You know, like people were sharing things in a in a fairly public forum. Um, that, that was just astounding to me. Things about their their personal lives and you know defeats and, and things they had um, with, with family and loved ones and stuff like that. So it kind of went really far off the course of being a business conversation, but it was really impactful because it let me know that 
yeah, there's an appetite for this kind of stuff, and it's bigger than the way we're framing these these conversations. You know, there's an appetite to to get out there and actually talk about failure and talk about about fear and talk about how you learn from those those experiences. So that's that's definitely one of those kind of aha moments that we had very early on in the, in the first year. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, and it resonates with me too. And some of the other people that I've talked to um, have said similar things. In that, you know, there's a lot of people out there who say, "Oh, embrace failure," you know, fail. But I think there's it's actually different than that. I think it's more about embracing risk, because you know, you don't nobody wants to fail on purpose. People don't intentionally fail, but the fear, reducing the fear, seems to be like one of the most important things you can do. If if you are in a fearful situation, uh, it's, I think it seems like it's very difficult to be agile. If you're being, if you're protecting uh, or trying to preserve something, uh, just like when you talked about, you know, self-preservation. Well, if I make a mistake, I'll get fired, or you know, or worse. Um, that fear becomes the the biggest barrier to experimentation and risk, and the, just the kinds of things that it, it takes to try to innovate or try new things. Yeah, you, you have to. You know, you have to go into it with a certain level of like. When I think an agility, and I hear that word, I instantly start thinking of like you know those trust exercises where you have to like swing from something to mm -hmm. grab onto something else, and you know that moment of of letting go. It's very symbolic because, you know, you have to let go in order to grab that next, the next rung, you know. And if you don't do that, you're you're not going to get anywhere. And it's scary to let go, you know. <laughs> like yeah. you could you could fall and, and all the rest of that kind of stuff that we don't tend to like to do. But it's only through that that letting go and that falling or the potential to fall that you're going to break through. And and sometimes you are going to fall. And you are going to fail at things. And I think that's OK. Like the, the growth of influencer has been, from some perspectives, it's been linear in the sense that we, we add new cities and we grow and that way. But then there have been other things that have been setbacks, you know, not having, you know, support from partners at different times. and you know, relationships pick up and leave, and so you're now you're starting from ground zero to, to establish new relationships with folks, and these things kind of repeat themselves over and over and over again, but you have to kind of fight through those moments, and that's with that letting go analogy happens, you know, because um, that's the only way you're, you're ever going to go forward is if you not fearless, because we all feel that, but you have to know how to process it and not let it stop you from doing the things you want to do. Can we go back to the the days on the trading desk? Because I'm really mm -hmm. curious. How do they... Um, there must be some mechanism or, or institutional way that they this gets, stuff gets learned on the job. Um, you're not going to put people, just throw people into a situation where they're they're uh, managing risk. I mean, at, the, at certainly at that level. Do you do you have any um, do you have any do you remember how you learned it? Yeah, it is to a certain extent the risk part of it. You're not thrown into right away. Um, when you join a trading desk, I was coming out of business school, so I was joining as an associate. Mm -hmm. You are partnered with another trader who um, is supposed to kind of walk you through the, the ins and outs of learning the business, of learning the language. That part of it pretty much is trial by fire. So, so it's like an, like an apprenticeship almost. Yeah, it is, with, with a lot of profanity <laughs> and no... Um, no structure. Okay. So, you know, three people joined the trading desk. Each of them are working with three different traders. Their experience, their experiences would be completely different based on the personality 
and style of the of the trader that they happen to be working with. So there isn't really a formalized um, program to teach you how to trade. The, the the firm does have like a formalized new employee program right. that that everyone goes through, to, regardless of what air group they're going to be in. And you kind of do that for your first few months when you walk in the door. But once you get your permanent assignment and you're sitting there on the desk, that is literally trial by fire, you know. And you and trading is a different language, so people on trading desk don't. It's English, but they don't speak in the same way in which we speak. So things are communicated in in very short, very specific ways of speaking. And if you don't say things in exactly this way, it's it's wrong. And okay, people, won't, so that... people won't understand you. And in all of that you have to kind of learn on your own. <laughs> Okay, well, that actually, that that's not dissimilar from what I've heard from other people in radically different environments, where you know the first step uh, in many cases is just immersion. So yeah. just you know, immerse yourself in the situation um, before you try and almost before you try and do anything. Uh, just try and understand what's going on and try and let go of some of your preconceptions. Um, and it sounds very similar. It sounds like you basically get, you get thrown into a situation that's very chaotic, and um, your first job is to just learn the you know figure out what's going on. Yeah. yeah, it's it's very much like okay, what did this person just say, and <laughs> how do I like we call it relaying? Like if if you're a trader and I picked up the phone and I got a message, I'd have to relay or give you that message or give you that piece of information and all of that is where the confusion comes in because you miss the speed you know at which things are ha is happening is mind-boggling how fast it all happens so what and was your what was what were your big um, what what was your big t learnings are, during that process? I mean, what were the things? Can you remember some aha moments where things started to click for you? Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there really isn't in like a one day where it makes sense. It's that you leave each day like you walk in like you're gonna have a heart attack. So there's a lot of anxiousness when mm. you just start walking in because you're afraid that you're going to do something wrong and doing something wrong on a trading desk is directly attached to money and it never goes in your favor so it's it, it, it's really like unlike any other environment that I could imagine to work in because that's really interesting because yeah. you were just saying how we need to reduce fear uh, to uh, to actually embrace risk, and yet you're you're talking about an environment where risk is risk management is the job, and mm -hmm. how full of anxiety and stress uh, you were walking in every day. That doesn't seem like the yeah. kind of environment that's going to be uh, conducive to being managing risk well. Yeah, you you learn once you learn you handle it. Better. But when you're when you're walking in, like, you know, not knowing anything, every 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 word, every phone call, every order is an opportunity to lose money mm. because you you don't understand, and someone isn't going to take the time. No one takes the time to explain it. So you know, how do you learn it? How how do you learn to? You make a lot of mistakes and get screamed at a lot, and then slowly the words it just starts to slow down. It's kind of like the Matrix <laughs> when like Neo starts to like connect and and the bullets start coming at him slower, or he perceives <laughs> them as being slower. Yeah, that's literally what it's like. Like well, maybe wow. on day one, you picked up the phone and a broker just. Spouted some gibberish and hung up. <coughs> Excuse me. 
and you didn't really understand anything. And then maybe like on day 25, you understood like 70% of it. And then maybe on like day 45, you understood all of it. But it just takes, you keep picking up that phone and listening to that broker or the trader next to you screamed at you to do something and or salesperson, or then eventually you just hear the words and the language and the cadence and it gets into your head. You know, but there's no there's no real way, like there's nothing to memorize because every situation is unique. You know, every each day is different, every stock is different, it's always different. But the core language remains the same, but you have to be kind of prepared for that. And so until you, you get comfortable with that, the days are, are filled with fear that you will mess something up. And like I said, when you mess it up, it's instant. You know, so a trading desk is an environment with instant feedback, which is price. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's pretty apparent if you're, if you're making or losing money. And, and it's public. So everyone can also see that. <laughs> well, that that actually, I mean, that, those are a couple things that I've just flagged as really interesting. So one is that, that the idea of instant feedback. So you always know how you're doing, even yes. when you're doing badly. Um, yes. And then another thing is that it's public, so it's transparent. There's no place to hide. You know, it's not like the yeah. guy you were talking about in the marketing, uh, in you know, situation where, um, you know, you could you could perhaps you know make a claim that you did everything right and uh, you don't know why it went bad because if you're getting instant feedback all the time uh, you probably are actually learning to connect even at maybe an unconscious level those things that you're doing with the kinds of reactions and actions that you get yeah you, you know right away and, and like that everyone you know the desk is kind of broken up into sectors but all positions are visible at any given time. So, you know, if I'm trading Pfizer, just, just anyone can look and see that we have a position in that and how's that doing, you know. Um, and same for me looking at someone else's mm -hmm. positions and just the way the desk was run. Um, so if you have a disaster on your hands, people know you have a disaster. So it's kind of like when... Um, you know, the, a pitcher is, is going for a no-hitter and, like, no one talks to him. Like, they all kind of <laughs> isolate themselves in the dugout from him. You start yeah. to feel like that. Like, no one really wants to talk to you while you're dealing with a the, with the bad position, except mm -hmm. for your boss who's usually screaming at you <laughs> as, yeah. to, as to why you have a bad position. <laughs> but it sounds like you're also, if you have that sort of shared uh, dashboard or shared kind of awareness of the situation, you also can perhaps learn from other people's mistakes, no? Or you, you can't definitely. And people will. It is somewhat of a supportive environment in that we can all communicate with each other. And, and there are times when people will kind of give you kind of a boost and and say like, "Oh, I see you're like you're dying over there in that. Like, mm -hmm. good luck." You know, <laughs> there is a certain level of camaraderie. Um, because everybody's because, been there. Yeah, everyone's been there, and it's an it's impossible to not. You're you're the only way you're not going to lose money in the business is if you're just not in the business. You know, it's it's part and parcel of how you how it works. You know, the only secret is not really a secret, but you try to minimize your losses and let your gains run. <laughs> easier <laughs> easier said than done, but that's pretty much how it works. You know, if you can do that more often than not, then you'll be successful. Um, so that that does speak to the agility part of it. That you do, you do have to be very agile in your thinking and also your short-term memory. You have to be able to let things go. You know, like if you've had a bad day, it's it's over. Um, or even if you're carrying a bad position in one stock, because you tend to tr you tend to trade multiple stocks. So if you're if you have a shift position in one stock, but things are going on in another stock, you still have to manage those things. Like it's not like you can sit there and, and do one thing. Um, so it is this environment of 
multitasking, instantaneous decisions, and to use your word, there is a there is a built-in agility to it just by the nature of the beast. You know, there's all these things happening all at once, and you can't afford, literally, you can't afford to sit there and fixate on any one thing, good or bad. Yeah, it sounds. I mean, there's a there's a thing that's come up in these conversations in the military. They call it situation awareness, which is kind of this idea. You want to know uh, everything that's and this is and you this, what you're describing actually has a lot of similarity to in, to this idea of the fog of war. You know, where they talk about you have you have limited information, uh, but you have a lot of it. But you have but it's sometimes conflicting, and you're trying to make sense mm -hmm. of it. And this idea of situation awareness is the idea that you want to know as much as possible. You want every single person to know what everybody else is doing, where they're at, uh, where the good guys are, the bad guys, uh, as much as possible. Um, because having that shared understanding, having everyone know as much as they possibly can, gives them more options, mm -hmm. gives them more choices about things they can do. And um, there's a huge amount of trust in there when people when you. When you put people in 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 a situation and you give them all the information you can, um, and you give them all the information and all the freedom and as much freedom of motion as you can allow, there's there's a lot of trust, and I can see how there's a lot of risk. <clears throat> there's definitely a lot of risk, and it's also, you know, in a world like finance or financial markets or what have you, you know, markets are designed to work because people have differing opinions about the same information. So there's a there's a ton of public information that's out there that you know anybody can pick up a Wall Street Journal or watch CNBC or Bloomberg or anything like that and kind of get an idea of what's going on in any particular stock or, or market. But you know, I could look at something and I think it's going up. I could read, you know, the same five things and say like, okay, this looks like a good opportunity. Someone else can read those same five things and say, oh, it looks like it kind of sucks. And we have a market. You know, for every buyer, there's a seller, and it's just a function of of where we choose to transact. But that that's how it works. Like it's it's you know, there's a lot of popular language that we've kind of used. I mean, there's more buyers and sellers and all that kind of stuff. But that's not really true. I mean, it, the market at any one point is in equilibrium. You know, um, it's just we've decided to transact at a certain price. Um, there's velocity, meaning if I'm more determined to sell than than you are, I'm willing to go lower. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, and conversely, people who have a more energy to buy, they're willing to go higher. But at any one time, those numbers are always the same. Um, but it's, it's also a function of interpretation. You know, like I said, I see it going up, you see it going down, we meet at a, at a price point. And that's how it works, you know. Yeah, um, and you, I mean, so you're making judgment. So what's the role of intuition and, in, like, just your gut in this, in this world <clears throat> that you're describing? Um, I don't think there's, a, I mean, I think people will use that language to say, Oh, I just had a gut feeling that I didn't trade like that, and not many people that I knew actually did. I think that sounds better in movies mm -hmm. and in books than it does in real life, because um, the the numbers are so big. You, you're not going into these situations based on like my gut. You know, you're you're kind of the the decisions are far more calculated than that. You know, um, because again, you're you're understanding risk, so you kind of know where the bodies are buried in any one situation, and you weigh all that. So, but how I, do you make a calculation like that in a in a short time span? I mean, um, uh, it can't be completely it can't be completely rational because you, the wheels of the brain just don't turn that fast, do they? No, they don't. But the the business is kind of designed to have some. There are some parameters, you know, so as a younger person, there's certain things you just can't even do. They won't you know, let you. They won't let you do them, you know, or if the situation is getting 
really big, there's controls to, to turn to a senior person and say, like, hey, this is getting kind of hairy. <laughs> you know, what can I do? What should I do? And then they kind of take it over. And then if it's really, really huge, to a certain extent, the time slows down. Um, because if you're going to do a really, really big transaction, like in the multiple hundreds of millions of dollars, those just need time to develop. So even in that perspective, it starts to slow down a little bit. Okay. So you're never really rushed to do the really big transaction. So the, the bigger the deal, the, the slower it's going to move, just like, yeah, a, just like anything in life. It's the bigger yeah. it is, the slower it generally moves. Yeah, so you, you could be, but even in that perspective, the, the time frame is still fast relative to other businesses, but mm -hmm. slow relative to what we do. So on my normal day, like what we call like blocking and tackling, you're doing tons of transactions and orders and proprietary stuff and, and client stuff, and it's very, very fast. Um, but if you're doing, like I said, a really huge, like, I mean, it could be six, seven, eight hundred million dollar transaction, that is going to probably take 30 minutes to a couple of hours to figure out how all of that's going to work. So that the firm is not at risk that are uncomfortable. There's always going to be risk, but you try to mitigate that risk again by kind of finding where the bodies are. So if you, if there's going to be a big transaction like that coming to the market, then clients are going to want to know. So you start putting feelers out there, and they're going to be the ones on the other side of the transaction. So you start laying that risk. Out. Hmm. You know. <coughs> so, uh, so, um, and now that you've you've moved on from that, do you find what kind of lessons from that time period in your life do you find yourself applying in the in this <coughs> in this new world that you're in today? Um, I think the new world moves at a more normal pace, and once you've sat in that seat your ability to handle pressure and stress is now, like, awesome. <laughs> so <clears throat> these the day-to-day the -day things that we deal with now and putting together an event, even one that's global, are not as pressing. Like, you always feel like, you know, this is not, I don't have the near-term cause and effect that I had in a pricing perspective. So the problems just appear to be far more manageable, even if they're in a way bigger from a logistics standpoint and a people standpoint. It's it's not like any one call or any one thing that I do today is going to cost me half a million dollars. <laughs> you know, so mm -hmm. from so from that perspective, you kind of keep it in a different frame. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So you kind of take those those lessons forward with you. You know, you're just able to process like a lot of information because you're used to the noise of just living. You know, so from that perspective, I could like I work in a in a co-working space um, called the Center for Social Innovation, which is really awesome. It's tons of different businesses that are all based. Uh, whether they're for profits or non profits, they're all based in doing something with a social purpose. And, <clears throat> you know, I can handle very easily the kind of ebb and flow of the space, the noise, the different things like that, because it's like a tomb compared to a, to a trading desk, <laughs> even, at, even at its most chaotic, you know. So I've been able to work at a high, at a high rate, a high functioning rate in any number of different environments, you know, whether it's working here in the office or being stuck in an airport somewhere in, in Amsterdam or being in Sao Paulo and stuck in traffic for hours. It's like all of those things are easy to process because A, you're kind of working towards your own best purpose, so it kind of goes with it, but 
it's it's um <clears throat> not as difficult as it was just dealing with the the stress, the aggravation, and the personalities that existed on the trading floor. Do you ever miss uh, aspects of it? I mean, uh, no, 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 not at all. <laughs> not I was all. just curious because you know it's like sometimes people, uh, <laughs> you know, this is probably an adrenaline uh, rush that you have in those kinds of situations, and uh, I like think I had I talked to one guy who said, well, he was actually um, at Ground Zero and. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a, he was part of the rescue kind of uh, situation there, and he said um, it was like the situation was calling him to greatness, and um, he felt like he rose to it. And then later he went back to his uh, desk job, and he just thought this is just too boring <laughs> compared to that. And that, that he was bored. <laughs> so I was just curious if you had any similar, you know, like. <coughs> No, not really. Only because, um, like, I think a trading desk is cool for making money. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if you are somewhat of an adrenaline junkie, maybe there is that rush. Um, the but there's no other that, purpose to it, is there, aside from making money? That is the purpose. No, that is the only purpose. You know, they'll pretend and say other things in marketing brochures, but it's it's solely to make money and as much as you can, as quickly as you can. Um, and so the pursuit of that to me lost its appeal, um, which is which is why I decided to leave the business and do other things. So I don't miss that because it's so incredibly limiting that I wouldn't have had any of I wouldn't know two-thirds of the people that I know now had I still been sitting there. Like, I wouldn't have had the experiences and adventures that I've had <clears throat> if I was still sitting there. I'd just be sitting there. Right. You know, and it's, and it's a really, really narrow world. You know, I mean, there's, there's people who can't think talk about or do anything with that mm. and they they speak in that language even when they're not there mm. you know so I could talk to friends of mine who are still in the business and they'll speak to me in trader talk and I'm like why are you talking like that but, <laughs> well and God, so I'm it, kidding. it does seem like you one of the things that um, <coughs> that you did take away from it though was a tolerance for risk and uh, mm -hmm. so like Say now things things just don't seem as big a deal, um, and uh, you're able to maintain a calm face on situations that other people might find really stressful. Definitely, I mean, I think you just realize like you were stressed out over nothing, like just stupid stuff, like really frivolous stuff, um, and now things are so much more meaningful. You know, they're meaningful because it's yours. Um, so to a certain extent, there's that pride of ownership, but then they're meaningful because these are the things I honestly think we need to look at and address in order to solve the really serious problems that the world's facing. You know, we have real challenges um, as humans. Um, and if we don't figure out better ways to work with one another, then this is all gonna fall apart. You know? It's kind of it's kind of like you quit your job on the Death Star to go work for the Rebel Alliance. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because I, I wrote a um, I wrote a blog entry about Jedi's and and talking about we actually don't need any more Jedi's. Let's so, hear about, t tell me about that. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of anti-Jedi. <laughs> Alright, let's hear about it. Let's hear your thoughts. Yeah, you know, not to get super nerdy, so I hope... I no, you can't get that. too nerdy for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but hopefully you'll get the analogy, and I'll send you the, the blog post. It could have gone on forever, but I try to keep it to like someone who got the basic gist of it without going into too deep examples of 
the movies and all that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> I just think like these systems are generally like broken. You know, financial systems, um, societal systems. A lot of them are, are really, really broken. But they become the norm. And I think the Jedi's actually, particularly when one watches the prequels, like they caused all the trouble. Like they were so dogmatic about the defending the Republic, they didn't realize that the Republic actually sucked. You know, mm. so like the Republic was corrupt, and they did corrupt things. You know, militarized themselves, like took on a clone army, like they did all these things that went against their principles, you know, because they they couldn't see the forest through the trees, you know, so for all their power, all their insight, they were so locked into defending this broken system, they didn't realize that they weren't the problem. Well, so, and, and how is that, and connect that to what's going on in the world today? Um, I think what goes on in the world today is that we have, like, a lot of people who use the language of innovation to basically like co-opt authentic innovative movements you know so they love the language of innovation they love the language of, of cooperation and collaboration all these kind of things but yet they do business just like how Goldman Sachs does business mm -hmm. you know and so you're not really interested in breaking the system down. You just want to be at the top of the system, you know, without yeah. realizing, like, hey, maybe, you know, we need to change the way education is in this country or whatever. Or maybe we need to examine, you know, capitalism is kind of fucked up and broken, you know? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. maybe we need to think, like, and really put forth new things instead of just tweaking the, the old stuff, you know, it's kind of putting lipstick on a pig, you know, but no one, very few people want to confront that. So we, we'd rather, like, put things out there like Tad that kind of talk about a lot of stuff, but then it's like, yo, this is for elites, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah, you put your videos online, but it costs like $6,000 to go to this. You know, like, what are you solving? You know, you're just talking crazy talk. You know, like, I, yeah. I don't know. Well, <laughs> it's, this is really interesting because I was just talking to someone earlier today um, who's doing work in uh, Uganda, and basically, like, um, one of his big... He said something very similar to what you just said about Jedi. He said one of the biggest problems is people um, needing to be heroes, Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit different than what you're saying, but he said, you know, it's like one of the most important characteristics in his mind to really make change happen in a complex environment is humility. You have to be humble enough to, um, and you have to be able to resist the um, the tendency for people to treat you like a hero. You know, like go mm -hmm. into a world where you might be. Um, uh, uh, treated as you know a very heroic character, and you have to be able to resist all the appeals to your ego, and really try and focus on um, understanding the situation and listening to the people and trying to understand what's really going on. And as long as you think of yourself as a hero who's coming in with solutions from outside, then um, you're probably going to be just as likely to do damage as you are to do good. Yep. I, I would agree with a lot of that. You know, the, the analogy I made was that we need more red pills. We need more of a Matrix model and less of a, of a Jedi model. I think the J Jedi story is very... Is the red pill the one that lets you uh, out of the Matrix? So you yeah, can, it lets you out of the Matrix. I can yeah. never remember which one is the blue yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, because, I mean, I think that was an honest assessment of what change is like. Like, the system that they were in was a false system. And when they got out of it, it wasn't cool. It sucked. Yeah. It sucked to be out of the Matrix. You yeah. know, you're isolated, the food sucks, your clothes suck. Like, it's terrible. And I think the people out there who are really trying to change, like, that shit's not sexy. 
it's 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 feeling marginalized. It's 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 like being told like you're crazy. It's it's difficult, you know. But the, the Jedi stuff speaks to that idea of like, oh, I'm gonna be the like you said, I'm gonna be the hero that's gonna walk in with the lightsaber and solve all these problems. And it's like it doesn't really it doesn't really work. You know, I think it just it just speaks to those same problems where everybody wants the spotlight. So, what yeah. does work in your opinion? <clears throat> what, 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 what are what are some successful ways to to do this? I think, you know, a successful way to to do this is to, like, I'm I'm gonna simply say like cut the shit, mm -hmm. but we have to examine like our own privilege. You know, and we can't be afraid to put, to, to me, everything is on the table for discussion in terms of how do we do things better. And if you have, like, kind of sacred cows that you don't want to touch or just assume that they're right or they're okay, then those are kind of non-starters for me. You know, we should be able, anything can be altered to work, you know, because clearly... <clears throat> In my estimation, it's not working. You know, it's not working for most of us. Um, so, how do we, how do we really start to address these issues? You know. Well, here, so how do you? I mean, so <clears throat> there's probably very few people who don't have a sacred cow or two, that mm -hmm. have things that they don't want to bring into the table. So, how do you get people to? Uh, how do you get them to open up? I mean, how do you get people to bring those? Uh, mm -hmm. At least make those sacred cows visible, or at least yeah. uh, acknowledge them. How do you start? How do you get those conversations going? Well, I think you find some other red pills. You know, you find some other people who kind of see things the way you see things, um, and not on every issue, but just broadly speaking. Um, then you have to start to operate. In a in a different mechanism, you know. So, like for example, when I when I started thinking about um, expanding influencer, I was going overseas, and you know, just in my mind, I was like, oh, I want to go to this city, I want to go to that city, I want to expand this. But you know, it comes from a Western control kind of thing where I'm like, oh, I have like intellectual property now, and I need to have like trademarks and contracts and non-disclosure agreements and all this kind of stuff because that's all the old way that comes from lack of trust which comes from fear. You're gonna take something away from me so I'm gonna have all these legal documents designed to make it hard for you to take what's mine. You know, so I got rid of all of that. <laughs> you know, I was like, fuck non-disclosure agreements, fuck all of that kind of stuff. Like, I produce a conference. You all know what a conference looks like. It's people in a room with some chairs and microphones. Like, that's it. Like, there's nothing proprietary to take. And, and how did that? How did that change? What what changed? What changed when you when you changed your approach? What? How did that change um, the world around I you? I found people who were willing to help me. You know, I wanted to make it easier for people to help me, not harder to people to help me. You know, so it's like, I don't need you to, like, sign anything. I share everything. Everything is for any, if you're on the team, if you're, like, on our city teams in Mumbai or Sao Paulo or wherever you do this in the world, everybody sees everything. Everything's transparent, you know. It doesn't mean like your voice is gonna trump mine because it's mine, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So I'm gonna kind of nudge it in the direction that I think it needs to go. But there's nothing that's like a secret from anybody, you know. And we you know, we have a a model where it's, you know, eat what you kill. So yeah, if I was really huge and I was walking in the door and I was paying you to do this for me. The, the, the construct automatically is different. But now I'm asking you, like, yeah, this is my platform. This is what I want to do. This is what I talk about. What do you think? 
and you say like, yeah, this is really cool. I want to do this. I'm like, boom, okay, we're doing it together. You know, how do we help each other out? Like, it's a it's an open environment, and I had to if I believe in those things, if those are in our core values, I have to operate in that way. You know what's interesting is that there's a parallel. I mean that that that's that's exactly you described exactly the same situation in the Goldman trading desk floor, where it's like everyone has access to everything. The, the information is completely available. Um, it's interesting. They're they're applied in totally different ways, yeah. but the principle is the same. It, it has to be transparent, and you have to trust. You know the guys in in you know I, I use Mumbai because they're furthest away. Mm -hmm. You know they're. They're my longest call. They're my furthest distance. All of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we have this can't work if I'm trying to control everything. You know, they need. They have to be empowered to make decisions. They have to have access to the, to the same files that I have because you know I'm awake when they're asleep and vice versa. You know, for for good chunks of the day. Um, it can't work. The only way this works is in the old model is if I have really huge partners who give me money that I then give to them, which is the old way. The new way where we build something together and we figure it out and we have fits and starts requires openness. It requires transparency. I don't think that's what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. That's no worries. awesome. No, this is just incredible. I think you just basically, uh, I think you mapped out just about every principle that I've heard from people. And so, um, and I think you kind of laid out the chain of connections between them too. Because uh, so, um, as long as there's a culture of fear and uh, stress. Then people are not going to be uh, able or willing to take risks. Yeah. As, long as, as long as there's no trust, I mean, you can't trust people if they don't have the information that they need to do their work anyway. Mm -hmm. So you uh, you, but at the same time, you to give them the information, you have to trust them. So it's kind of a catch twenty two, and I can see how it's almost like you you make the analogy of taking the red pill. You almost have to invert. Um, your your sense of the way things work in order to actually make if, it work. If people are going to do bad things to you, they're going to do them no matter what. Like any contract that someone signs, it's only as as good as your ability to enforce it. You know, so yeah, if you want to tangle yourself up in court for months, and chase people down for these really ambiguous kind of ideas, then feel free. But I, I feel like the more I've given, the more I've gotten. You know, I've had people sight unseen invite me into their homes, let me stay with them. Um, I mean, I think a lot of times, and I'm going to generalize, you know, American, we view the world as like this really scary place, like uh, everyone hates us, and you know, how can you go to these places, and how do you travel, you don't know anybody, and you don't, how do you meet these people? And, I found just the opposite. I, I think the world is filled with incredibly kind, generous people. You know that have given me food out of their kitchens and keys to their to their homes and said like, "Hey, lock the door when you're leaving." You know, and I didn't know this person three weeks ago. We had a Skype conversation. You know, um, I, I I wouldn't have been able to do this without. You know, so I, I can only do this because I live this all the time. You know, I meet incredibly generous people. Um, and I think they respond to the fact that I'm pretty transparent with them. You know, there's nothing there's nothing hidden so there's they feel safe. You know. And I think transparency provides security. You know, I think it's one of the old things that, like, our government does. Like, they believe by keeping things from us that they keep us safe, and I don't believe that. Yeah, so it's yeah. like, you know, this idea that, you know, when there's nothing hidden, people feel safe. I, 
I went through this in my own company where we were we went from being um, we opened up the books and so people could see the state of the business at every day and I do remember when we first did that it was pretty traumatic for a lot of people to realize um, how fragile a business is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like you get used to having a salary and a job and you think it kind of think it's gonna be there forever. And when you first get access to that information, it is a little scary. Or at least it seemed to me that it was a little scary. I had always had access, so I saw people getting it. Mm -hmm. And it was like, wow, you know, this is I'm, these people should be happy. Look, we made a profit three months in a row. <laughs> it's like they're just they're nervous, they were terrified. Um, but over the longer term, what happened was people became uh, better business people. They became more confident. They became better at making decisions because they knew how the different things that they were going to do uh, yeah. would impact. They're, all that stuff. they're stakeholders now. You know, they can like I think sometimes when you're in an organization, you think the organization is like impervious to all injury and pain, so you act accordingly. You know, you spend crazy, you're not as focused, but when you see, like you said, that things are fragile, you know, you take more care of them because you're like, wow, you know, like, this teamwork shit matters. Like, we are actually in it together. Like, I can't really fuck this up. But if you're thinking, like, oh, this is, a, this is an organization separate from myself and who cares, you know, just kind of figure it out, then it doesn't, then it doesn't really matter. You know, I think, like, kind of a, to kind of go back to your friend with Ground Zero, you think about like something like 9 11, you know, years later, or months later, whenever you find out, like, hey, you know, different organizations had different pieces of this puzzle. You know, like mm -hmm. this agency here got this little piece of information, and this agency here had this little piece of information, but no one connected the dots mm -hmm. because they don't talk to one another. You know, you have a clearance here, I have a clearance there, no one talks, no one communicates, and so you can't put the puzzle together to solve the problem. You know, you don't even have a chance of solving the problem. Because everyone's, everyone's keeping their secrets. Everyone's keeping their little fight them. And the more, like I said, we make things open and transparent for everything, the better it'll be. You know, because now we have information. And information allows you to make better informed decisions. Yeah, well, so there's a couple things there that you're talking about. One is that um, about <coughs> relation, person, just relationships and people and ha having an approach to the world that is sort of assumes that people are good and trustworthy. But another is about, you know, the infrastructure that's required to provide that transparency and that openness. And it's, um, um, you know, one person working alone can't necessarily do that. Or let's say in your organization where you had to make that decision to do that. Um, you know, the, the uh, individuals can't necessarily open up uh, any any information other than their own. Mm -hmm. But then, how we choose to work with one another, like to your earlier question of making that change, is like you know, I chose to make influencer run a certain way and. When I try to engage our community to work together, I try to encourage those same theories, you know, where it's like, you know, and, and a lot of it is money based, like how much time you're giving people, we try to quantify these things, and again, those things are also very, like, old school, like, you know, um, if we can, if I could find a way to give you my time or share something with you and then you give me something else I need. I don't want to make every conversation or every interaction I have with the person, well, excuse me, a transaction. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also very like old world way of thinking of things, you know, very industrial age, you know, like I spent this amount of time it equals this, like we've kind of taken our humanness and turned it into numbers, you know, based on time and money, and if you reject that in the way you meet with people and deal with them, I think you start to change that that paradigm a little bit. You know, it's case by case, it's smaller, but, you know, I try to live by these principles and, and hope that 
they become bigger movements because when people see it working, then they'll say, oh, you know what? There is a different way. And so the, do you, do you think that we're, that we're in, but that we are in the midst of a transformation from uh, an old way of doing things to a new way? I mean, you've said that a few different times. Yeah, um, I, think, I think the potential is there, but I don't think it's going to be linear. A, because I think, like, the co-opters will steal the language and, and fuck it up. Um, and I think we need like more fallout. Like there needs to be more kind of disruption in the financial world, you know, um, which we kind of held off with the bailouts, but we didn't solve anything. So it's still really weak and fucked up. But most people don't realize that because they think the economy is the stock market. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So as long as that's going up, they're under this illusion that things are cool. Um, so I think we need like another shooter drop, you know. Like I'll, I'll steal from Louis C.K. It's like we need people like going across the country with donkeys with, you know. Um, I don't know. I haven't heard him talk about that. Yeah, he, he has a skit. He does. Very, you know, it's like everyone, everything's better, but nobody's happy. And, mm -hmm. and it's like... One of the things he, he says is like, you know, maybe it won't be so bad if it's like back to the depression where people are like walking around with like pots and pans on donkeys, you know, because we've <laughs> kind of gotten all the shit out of the system, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and being facetious, of course. So, but I think kind of the, like we, we need that. Like, I think right when things got really bad in the last financial crisis, that's when we started to see all these other things come up. That's where like Zipcar yeah. came from and Airbnb, yeah. like that kind of dip in the economy was when people were like, fuck, we need to do something different. But then they kind of like put the finger in the dike mm -hmm. and then things kind of marginally got better. But now, so now you're kind of seeing, we're going back to the bullshit. You know, we're going back to the like, oh, it's cool to waste and consumerism and look, it's not so bad and blah, 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 but no, it is. <laughs> So we base. I mean, I th I think I agree with what you're saying. Is that you know what you're saying is that there are, um, so there was probably the there's there there is there was a kind of a, a awareness and a a mind opening that happened around the time of that you know big financial crisis. Not only of the people who were um, kind of impacted negatively, but also the people who had a lot to protect. Mm -hmm. and so. You know, there's a, there's a lot of politics and and uh, bailout and so forth stuff around, and even if you can see it, even with taxi drivers and Uber, and the mm -hmm. sort of battles that come about between uh, entrenched interests who have sort of maybe they have the resources to hold off the, uh, you know, it's like the Roman Empire it took a long time for the Roman Empire to fall, right? Because they had a lot of wealth to fight off the barbarians, uh, mm -hmm. but and I think it, it feels to me like a holding action. Now it feels to me like there, there's. It's just it's maybe it maybe I'm overly optimistic, but it does seem like there's a um, uh, there's an inevitability to uh, transparency happening. I mean. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 you know, just just from a technology standpoint, technology don't doesn't want anything to be private or secret. Mm -hmm. I, I do I do definitely agree that I am generally optimistic, but I'm optimistic with the caveat that we got to fight for that optimism. You know, like I, I I wrote a piece like I think last year where I talked about like being positive is actually one of the hardest things you can. You know, like, it's kind of really hard to be positive all the time, you know, because you're, you're inundated with, like, shitty information. So it's just like a work. It's a it's good work to make yourself be in a good place, consistently in a good place. And I think, like, change, positive change can happen, but only if you're diligent. You well, know? You, you seem like you, you care and you think and you feel like the, the, the work that you're doing is important and it's relevant and timely. Um, is that what keeps you going? Yeah, definitely. I think, like as I say all the time, like I'm, I'm in my own best purpose. Like this is the culmination, I think, of all the things that I've experienced in my life. You know, whether it's growing up in Brooklyn and 
you know, my parents were immigrants. My parents came here from the West Indies, and you know, the New York that they came to. I don't know if it would be possible for them to do what they did in the seventies today because of how New York is and it's more expensive and it's just just not cool with that, you know. And that that concerns me, you know, because I'm like, you know, we're kind of building this 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 two tiered society, you know. Um, and I don't I don't know how long that's gonna sustainable, you know, but if we don't speak to that, you know, then then where are we going to be in the long term, you know, um, and, and you know, my parents, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, but they were able to go take us to museums and take us around the city and stuff like that, and, you know, I had my, my niece is 10, and I took her to um, the Met, and the Met allows you to kind of pay what you want, but if you pay full price, you know, met like twenty five dollars a person to walk into a museum. <laughs> you know, that's like kind of a lot of money. You know, when when people are are making a lot of money. I mean I, I love the space I'm in. I think it's a beautiful space and it's filled with people doing a lot of great, amazing things, but there's no CSI in Brownsville, Brooklyn where I grew up. You know, and why is that? You know, like we need to to fight for those who the stuff that we do on a day to day basis is like might as well be a couple man on the moon. You know. Well and so that's how that, do you that's um, that privilege, you know? So you, you mentioned language and how, you know, that there are people who are happy to speak the language of innovation and happy mm -hmm. to kind of talk to talk, although they they have they're not necessarily walking the walk. How do you um, how do you maintain Sort of, um, how do you maintain the, um, how do you just maintain your movement in the in the face of that? How do you keep people yeah, from co-opting the language and taking the superficial aspects and? Um, um, I think you call them live. I think you try to call them on it. You know, like, you know, the things that I don't agree with, I, I'm an opponent of them. You know, like I, I ask people, like, for example, I know a lot of, of incredible. Um, women who are really involved in like bringing diversity to any number of different fields, but even the conference world, you know, they'll say like, oh, there are no female speakers, and they're like, why is that, blah, blah, blah. And I asked them, I'm like, well, then why are you going to those events? Like, why are you supporting these people? But, you know, we get caught up in it because, again, it's like, it's, it's the matrix, you know, it's like we support Davos and we support World Economic Forum and I'm like, it's a bunch of rich people having a party for a week talking about how the world's going to be better. I'm like, why don't you have that event in Haiti? <laughs> you know, yeah, well, like, there's a certain break. degree that you, you know, on the one hand, you have to immerse yourself in a system and, and understand it to the in order to be able to change it. So there's that one piece. Um, but there's also the piece of, you know, sometimes it's easier and better to change things from the outside than it is from the inside. So it seems like there's there's a balance that needs to be struck between but definitely I don't I don't have the answer, but I just I just feel like some of those things are like that system that I was talking about. Like where the Jedi's are defending those systems. They're like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like it's cool to like go to these chateaus and <laughs> hang out for a week and look. I'm with Bono and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Because I'm a Jedi. And this is what we do, you know. And I look at that and I'm like, huh. You're kind of just doing the same shit. You're a Jedi who took the blue pill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Peter <laughs> Peter Buffett wrote a really good piece that that has stuck with me last year. Um, he, he calls it the philanthropy industrial complex. You know, which I, I highly recommend checking out because again, he's, he speaks to these kind of issues. He's like, you know, we, you know, I sit at these tables with really wealthy people and powerful people who, in one hand, these systems empower to make a lot of money, and then they take, with the other hand, some of that money and give it to people who don't have. But the original system is what keeps those people not having. <laughs> in the first place, 
He's like, you need to address that system that's creating these people who don't have. Not just taking our profits from that system and giving it to them. But it's like, uh, the system is why they don't have shit. That actually came up in the, uh, both of them. I had two other interviews today, and it came up in both of them, this idea that, um, you know, um, you're going to, for example, one of the examples was, okay, some guy is going to collect a million shirts and give them to people in Africa. And it's like, well, that, on the surface of it, that sounds great. But there's people already in Africa who are making shirts for a living. Mm -hmm. for people in Africa and sure. you know this, this reminds me of the the Jedi thing it's like okay well you might sound you might be able to convince yourself that you're a big hero by you know collecting a, a bunch of shirts and giving them to people in Africa but actually you're you're just perpetuating the system you know you're perpetuating a system where people are um, sort of um, dependent on yeah. you know, if you do it that way yeah. And, and how are we compensating people? Like, we are comfortable living here, myself included, you know, being able to go to Target or whatever your low-cost retailer is and buying five T-shirts for $10 without thinking that slaves made those T-shirts. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like I, I, you know, that, that idea of language. Like, I'm no longer saying, like, slave wages or... It's not they're they're slaves, you know. Like just because they're getting paid like some minimal amount of money doesn't make them not. There's no mobility. Their conditions are horrible. But I live here and I benefit somehow from that. And I have to call myself on that because it's a reality. Like maybe iPad should cost two thousand dollars, not seven hundred dollars. Like we don't know the cost of things, you know, because there's a human cost that we are now become accustomed to and comfortable with. And I think we need to confront that, you know, because that's one of those systems that's so broken and morally there's issues with those kind of things, you know. Um, and we all do the best we can, you know. Um, myself included, like I said, I buy shit just like everybody else, but at least I try to be cognizant of how these things all work and why they're the way they are and I think those are the systems that we need to constantly kind of push back against as much as we can. Um, yeah, it's like kind of like what you, it's kind of like what you said at the beginning of our conversation and you kind of stumble through it. Yeah, you stumble through it. Like none of us are perfect. We're all imperfect beings. We do the best we can but when you to know these things and ignore them is the problem or to pretend that it's okay when it, I know deep down in my heart that it's not okay. You know, like I don't need to know those people, but one of our values is empathy. You know, and it's it's something as human beings, I think we need to have more empathy and vulnerability. You know, it's, it's you know, you have to be vulnerable to tell people like you're afraid or like you're worried about things and share those things with other people instead of, you know, the old adage, you know, fake it until you make it. Like, everyone in New York pretends that everything's cool, and then they live these lives of quiet desperation. You know, you see it with the way we medicate ourselves, and these famous people who, who kill themselves, you know, like a Philip Seymour Hoffman, you know, seemingly this guy has everything. Mm -hmm. But yet, what drives you to medicate yourself to the point where you kill yourself? You know, because somehow in his life, he had no other way to turn. And those things are not healthy, and we see it everywhere, you know. Um, so we try to, by talking about these values, I might not be doing a talk about him, but when I'm talking about vulnerability and, and empathy and compassion, hopefully those things will trickle into all these different things, you know, because I think those are the values that we need more of. And do you have a vision of what it looks like on the other side when we've accomplished this stuff? Do you have a picture? I don't know. I, I don't know. That's a great question. I wish I had a picture of my mind. Um, no, I don't have a picture. Because I, I think it's a work in progress all the time. I don't, I don't know if there's an end, like a finish line. I think it's like this is the work we have to do because it's the work I do. You know, like I wake up, some days I have a good day, some days I'm jealous and angry and envious of those who seemingly have more and I have to 
talk myself off that ledge and say, well, you know, I don't know what's going on in your life. You know, like, I got to look at myself and stay focused and whatever. But yeah, there's definitely days like that, especially with social media. You know, you read somebody got a big deal or somebody did something great. You're like, fuck, why wasn't that me? You know, like, that's <laughs> normal. But then it's how you process that and don't internalize it and allow it to, like, get you off your game. You know, like, you can't look at other people. But I think, like, social media encourages that to make us all unhappy. You know, so we, so, you know, we ask people in the conference to not be on social media. So, like, mindfulness is one of our, is one of our values. And so we want you to kind of turn shit off. Like, turn your phone off, turn your iPad off, turn your computer off. Like, be present in this moment and, and write things down. And then if you want to do all the rest of that stuff later, that's great. But our business model is that we want you to be present, um, which, you know, partners and advertisers don't like because they want you hashtagging and tweeting and <laughs> stuff. And we don't want that because it's not really effective. You know, so that's one of those compromises that we, that we haven't made. We're like, no, fuck that. You know, well, if you don't if you don't get that, then you're not part of what we're what we're looking to do. You know. I really appreciate your time today. I, I realize we're just about at the end of it, so yeah, no problem, no problem. Thank you so much. I'm um, wow. I uh, I don't know what else to say. I've just been. Uh, I'm going to look up the philanthropic industrial complex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll and I'll send you my Jedi Matrix thing so you can take okay. it. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Philip. It's been really great talking to you today. Thanks. I really appreciate the time. Anytime, if you have any other questions, or anything, feel free. I love what you're doing, and um, I love to chat. So hopefully, it was valuable. I love what you're doing too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Bye. -bye.